David Curran's been making some nice progress on the storage layer. And I just, uh, people can see my check-ins. I just check in since, well, why don't we just begin with a tech update and then I'll update on what's going on with Vulcanize. Um, <coughs> um, so tech update, uh, as I said, as I mentioned, uh, David Curran um, has been making some nice uh, progress on the storage layer. Um, so that's <coughs> very exciting. Um, uh, it looks, looks like that, that's at least uh, the, uh, you know, an initial implementation is coming along quite nicely. I've been thinking about how we give it, um, uh, give it the a monadic um, facade uh, and what that means. So uh, maybe if David comes on, David and I will talk a little bit about that. I mean, his API is essentially put in get. Um, <clears throat> but what we want to do is hide the get behind a, a forward comprehension. And there are a couple of ways to achieve that. Um, and then um, uh, I, um, uh, back in 2013, I developed uh, a, a mechanism, and I'll go, I'll go into that in more detail in, in some other um, uh, developer-specific context. But I developed a mechanism for parsers that utilizes the functional um, notion of a zipper. So essentially, a zipper takes your um, in this case, you can think of it as an expression tree, right? And, and divides it into the context and then the subtree that plugs into the context. And so, um, and people can see this in the prolog parser um, that I wrote in Special K, which I wrote in about a day and a half <laughs> under extreme pressure because we discovered that our, our existing Scala-based parser was not going to cut it at scale. <laughs> and so that's how I came up with this this approach, and it it, it seemed to work at, at at the scales we were we were testing it under. So um, I think it'll be fine for you know at least for our, our initial uh, initial implementations. Uh, but essentially, the, so the idea is you you as you're walking the outer term structure, um, th that's where you're maintaining a con or sorry, as you're walking the tree, you maintain the context of the thing that you're uh, parsing and compiling. Um, and you, <coughs> you just work on the subtree. Uh, and then you can accumulate this in, this in this nice way without doing a lot of copies, right? So you can do in-place updates um, using the zipper structure and that's what makes it uh, somewhat efficient. I, I don't think it's as efficient as it could be, but, but it makes it a lot more efficient than uh, <coughs> potentially other approaches that are purely functional. Um, so, uh, so I've, I've laid in the groundwork for that, uh, for the source to source translation. For people who are interested in the source to source, uh, in, in what's going on here, <coughs> I'll draw a little picture because it's useful. Um, let me see. Let's, there we go. <coughs> there we go. Duplicate with that and then do a screen share. Um, share screen. And here we go. Okay, so the current compiler um, uh, is the, 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 the compiler structure that I'm building right now looks like this. <coughs> Go grab a shapes. Okay. So, and we'll, we'll write the data this way so we can distinguish the data. Okay, so in count, or maybe let me change that to what, this. Okay, so in comes some Rolang source. So this is Rolang source. And the compiler uh, is going to, ultimately what we want to produce is Rosette VM, uh, VM bytecodes. Okay, <coughs> so that's our target. And that code will be um, part of the deltas that are stored in the, um, and the storage layer that's, um, that uh, David Curran is currently working on. So um, one really, really simple approach 
is to do uh, Rolang source to Rosette source. So here we produce Rosette source. Um, and then from there, we plug it directly into um, the, uh, the Rosette compiler, the existing Rosette compiler. And that produces that. And that gives us, um, that gives us a really nice little pipeline, um, which, you, which maximizes stuff that we've already got and we've vetted and is, um, and is um, <coughs> fairly uh, um, robust at this point. Um, the other thing that's nice is that um, uh, this piece here, here, get rid of that. So this piece here is currently um, on, under um, revision, right? So we're going to take that. We're going to take that and produce a new one of those. Um, sorry, I should let me expand this out a little bit so that we also have the Rosette VM. Okay, and then so here we have the Rosette VM, right? And the Rosette VM can be fed the bytecode and executed. Okay, so this um, piece here is being recompiled, uh, being, uh, uh, not recompiled, but um, uh, re-implemented in, in Scala. So currently we have a C++ implementation, so let me notate that here. There's a C++ implementation. And we're in the midst of um, building a Scala implementation. Okay, so the nice thing is that notice we can um, we can work on this much of the compiler. We can work on this much of the compiler independently of this work here, right? So, uh, so if we imagine that, um, let me do it this way. Okay, so there we go. Okay, so initially, cool. So <coughs> um, initially, we're just targeting this much in terms of the re-implementation, but then over time, we can expand this out, right? And then we can continue to reuse this much of the of the current implementation, which I think is not bad from a tooling perspective and also from a project management perspective, right? In terms of getting to market as fast as possible with as much um, robust code as possible. So this is preserved regardless of what's going on here, right? And um, and this is also nice because if we think about it, uh, completely independent. Um, <coughs> there we go. Completely independent of this implementation here, um, the storage layer is storing and shipping around this stuff, right? So there's no there's no need. Um, there's 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 uh, 
that this team can be working uh, completely independently of the storage team, right? So they can, the storage team can be, uh, and also of uh, the uh, consensus team, right? So the team that's, uh, the, the folks and the work uh, that's going on in the implementation of Casper can work almost completely independently and just be utilizing this compiler pipeline for, uh, for quite some time until this pipeline comes online. So we can have uh, we can have prototypes that are um, um, yeah. we can have prototypes that are are uh, functional and um, sorry there we go. Uh, functional and and uh, you know uh, able to run contracts um, quite early right so people will be able to write and play around with and and explore and debug uh, contracts um, uh, well in advance of having this at uh, production ready right and this this will be uh, quite solid in terms of its performance um, so that's uh, that's why we're taking this approach. So what I am doing right now, and I just, che just checked in a, a bunch of code that uh, supports this process right here, right? And then this process, this piece of the puzzle is already written and um, there'll be a replacement of this. Let me go and grab, um, here we go, this one. There'll be a replacement of this, uh, in the not too distant future as we get more um uh, more of the resources online grab all this what about this there we go like that so hopefully that that makes sense and let me just check in with folks and, and see if if everyone understands what i'm saying um joseph i know you had a, a an interest in this and you've been asking about these this kind of stuff when we do our um, our uh, uh, row VM uh, discussions. So ho hopefully this is this is making sense and providing you know um, uh, import input for that. Oh yeah, without a doubt. Um, it's and it's kind of it's kind of what you've been saying for a little while now. I think um, it's important. I think to express that because um, when people look into Rosette, they're going to uh, see that Rosette's based off of um, actor semantics, uh, but it's important to know, I think, that um, the process calculus and actor semantics um, reciprocate each other in, in a lot of ways, so that doesn't limit the expressiveness of Rolang to, um, or, or the semantics are correctly preserved throughout this entire process. Um, but I am I'm curious if, um, exactly to what extent Rolang would be limited by the, by the Rosette compiler, and do you see that being a, a smooth transition with their re-implementation? Uh, I do, that's, so that's a good question. That can help me flesh out this diagram. Um, and, and probably the simplest way to do that, so let me uh, just quickly. <coughs> so one, one way to think about <coughs> um, what, we're, what we're talking about here is that there's a, a small standard library let me, that um, facilitates the compilation to make sure that the target has the semantics that we want, right? So what we're trying to do is to ensure, just as you said, that the semantics here doesn't provide, <coughs> that there's an impedance match between the semantics here and the semantics here. And the way we facilitate that uh, impedance match is to recognize that there's a small piece of Rosette source <coughs> that's always available. So we can think of it as a little library that we utilize. Uh, now, now, the reality is in a production implementation like this, um, <coughs> so, pardon me, since that Rosette source is going to be common to every uh, every uh, compilation. You factor it out and you put it all the way down here. But but for purposes of this discussion, 
let's let's do it this way. So the ro there's the rosette source that's associated um, with the main Rolang program, and there's some additional rosette source that's associated with every compilation, which is uh, uh, the impl the tuple space implementation. Um, Expand this out a little bit. So there, that that's really what's going on. So this produces this, and that source depends upon an implementation of the tuple space, and and with the tuple space and the source of the program together, they provide a full and faithful implementation of um, the semantics that's, that is uh, defined by the, the, the uh, Rolang source that's coming in, right? And then, and then over time, um, what, will, what will happen? So, so right now I have a rosette source that's, <coughs> that is, um, uh, um, that, that implements the tuple space stuff. But that can be migrated <coughs> over here, right? So you, you take it and you, you make it a native thing that lives down in this space, right? So this is native tuple space. Implementation. So that's <coughs> um, that's how you get this to be um, uh, uh, sort of production production quality. I see. So so when this entire when this entire process is completed, then the end result, the entire result, will be RoVM. That's right. That, that, um, that's exactly right. Well, what the, so 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 uh, again, Rho VM is is largely a virtual entity, right? The, yeah. the real the real VM is a VM that has a tuple space library associated with it. Exactly. Yeah. Right. Um, and actually, I changed that to a, a round one. Uh, let me go. Okay, there we go. Yeah, so that's uh, that's 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 what happens, and and then and then essentially, you know, that is replicated down here, right? So, <coughs> so then this thing here uh, looks like I have to. Sorry. This thing here um, also becomes extended, right? Because it's now going to be a full and faithful implementation of that thing, right? So that becomes the native implementation of tuple spaces in Scala. And by the way, there are like half a dozen of these that exist as open source in Java, right? So any any of those that have been beaten on long enough could uh, provide uh, uh, an off-the-shelf solution here. Right, so we don't have to do our, our an implementation. I'm likely to do one anyway, um, because uh, as a part of uh, organizing it around uh, uh, a better implementation of continuations and delimited continuation. But but you know the the reality is the thing could be done um, the thing could be done completely with off the shelf components, making making the time to market even faster. Yeah, and I think it's it's important to, to note and uh, <coughs> consider this in uh, his early work with uh, with what he's been doing with the data structures, but that it would be um, more uh, it would be more extensible to use uh, to use uh, mappings or uh, maps rather than tuples uh, because you inherit a lot of uh, abilities to do uh, case class pattern matching and, and such, right? Yeah, yeah. Uh, what what the keys are is. 
is, is again, it's a matter of, um, it's a matter of, of um, discussion, right? And so, yeah. and, and this is, this is a, this is where the, the tree, the work that David is doing on the tree then, um, uh, you know, starts to overlap uh, here, right? So essentially you can, um, with, with, if you squint, you can begin to see that this starts to look remarkably like the tree that David is implementing, right? <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Now, now things start to get even, they come into even sharper focus. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, so, uh, hopefully that, that, that gives a little bit of a, um, an overview. David, uh, did you want to give an, an update on, uh, on the work that you were doing with the storage layer? You're muted if you're talking. Uh, okay, maybe uh, maybe a little bit later. <laughs> uh, oh, sorry, right. sorry. Yeah. I'm having breakfast with the kids here. It's, uh, it's madness. I just, just <laughs> thought, sorry. I totally understand. <laughs> Being a father, I totally get it. Yeah. But yeah, yeah, I'm I'm making progress. Um, uh, um, just it's more of an exploration, really. So, you know, um, I'm discovering things as I build. So. Um, you know, we had a discussion last week about using a hashes to identify nodes as opposed to, um, you know, a fixed identifier. And, you know, it's pretty clear that, uh, well, we're using, you know, we're using um, these identifiers on nodes. They're just, they're purely just internal pointers. So I think it's kind of overkill to use hashes when hashes make our, you know, read and, well, our write complexity um, is much higher with hashes. So, this week, I, you know, I tried using UIDs, and I've kind of been going on, you know, going along with that. Uh, we can talk about, you know, that in more detail maybe at the stand up. Um, yeah, no, that's that's great. No, I'm. I'm I also, I, go ahead. I also discovered that that um, well, the assumption that we're making about being able to store data only at leads is just uh, not. <laughs> so. Uh, <laughs> So yeah. uh, the, tree, the tree just doesn't work uh, like that, which um, I was just, I don't know, I had the blinkers on a little bit and was concentrating on other stuff and then wondering why I couldn't get all of the, all, you know, I, I put all of the words in the English language into the tree and, um, you know, it, it didn't work. <laughs> so, uh, so, so then you re realize uh, that you do, in fact, have to store data. <laughs> yeah, I realized there was there's basically one insertion case that I wasn't considering, and that's the insertion case that I wasn't considering. So, because yeah. there's, I don't know, there's like five or six different cases for insertion into the tree that you have to handle. So, uh, yeah, so the tree's working apart from that one insertion case, which I just need to fix. So, again, we can talk about that at the, the stand-up. Uh, understood. Yeah, understood. Um, cool. But uh, yeah, make, making progress. But you know, it's at this stage really, it's kind of uh, you know, it's a bit of a, it's a bit of a, you know, a journey of exploration into really the data structure. That's kind of the thing I'm kind of most interested in is making sure that we have a data structure that's really, you know, suits the suits the suits our purposes. No, that's that's great. I mean, this this is exactly the kind of work, and and a lot of the work I ha I, I confess is is as much about sort of building an understanding um, that that is you know wider than just one person, <laughs> right? Yeah. Because because what, once you have the understanding, well, you know, the code can be rewritten, you know, like um, in in really just a short period of time, um, or 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 chunks of the code, important chunks of the code can be rewritten. But they can't be rewritten if you don't understand what it's supposed to do, and that's that's a that's a, a lot of what this early work is 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 largely just building up a common understanding, you know, uh, within the within the team and and the community that's interested in, in development uh, aspects. Um. Exactly, and and that's kind of how I that's kind of <coughs> how I understand anyway is by actually you know is by actually just working out practically how, how things are going to work so that's kind of my that's the reason i guess i'm taking this approach is it it means that we have to you know 
when we start working with concrete things, uh, it means that we, uh, yeah, we have to we have to make sure that we understand. What's going on. Agreed, one hundred percent. Yep, I, I absolutely agree. Uh, okay, so now let me give an update uh, and just check with uh, check and see. Uh, if uh, well, it looks like uh, the vulcanized people aren't around. I was hoping they might come and join us. So we're we're uh, what we haven't commenced. <laughs> we were hoping to commence yesterday. Um, uh, HJ had a really good idea, and this is going to be um, and, and uh, which I want to talk about very soon um, uh, in, in this in this uh, update on vulcanized. The vulcanized people are uh, are are. are um, responsibly making sure that uh, that everything in the process is properly tested and and I applaud them for their for their standing up for code quality and and um, uh, because you know potentially there's a there's a large a large amount of cash that's flowing through this and so I, I appreciate them sticking by their guns also um, we have had a little bit of um, so just sort of organizational stuff that had to had to take place around the contract with Vulcanized since we had a third party enter into the mix uh, to help uh, pay pay for their costs, um, and so that that required a, a three way contract, and it took a little bit of time to coordinate on that. Uh, so that's another reason why things have been a little bit delayed. Um, you know, uh, again, I I apologize that the. The process is is hard to nail down in terms of time, but this is how software happens sometimes. And uh, you know, I I prefer to in this particular space to err on the side of quality <laughs> rather than to err on the side of speed. Um, and so I think that that's that's uh, that's that's kind of where we are. Um, the last estimate I got um, from uh, Adam. Uh, was uh, a few weeks away. I don't think we're anywhere near that um, uh, in uh, in reality. But that was sort of the estimate that he felt comfortable giving. I think we can uh, we can be a little uh, quicker than that. But let's uh, let's see. I will have um, the repo um, the repo links for people to follow the progress of the uh, the artifacts. And uh, I will ask that you know people contact me uh, if they have any questions about the the code in the redemption process repo. Uh, so rather than to bug the 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 vulcanized people, um, but that's that's kind of the the update for now. Um, let's see what else uh, do we have? Um, <coughs> another. Um, Another uh, <coughs> uh, update was we had a really good um, presentation um, with the Seattle Ethereum meetup. Um, a lot of people came. Um, that was the presentation was recorded, um, as I understand it, and will probably be available whenever uh, Christian gets settled. Uh, he's he's off to to um, Russia right now for um, an event there. Um, <coughs> but um, uh, that, that went quite well. There were a lot of people there and there were uh, potential investors there and, and everyone um, not just had a good time, but they, they all said they were, they were quite enthusiastic about the work. They seemed very impressed by the, uh, the level of thought that's gone into um, the architecture and um, and the uh, the organization and and the overall approach to the problem. So I was I was very happy. I was also super impressed. Um, uh, uh, jo Joseph, Joseph Denman put together a little draft um, uh, uh, um, a model. Uh, sorry, uh, uh, a load balancer um, and. Um, and and walk the crowd through that, uh, and I think that's it's it's a testament to to his uh, his intelligence and patience with the process. But also, I, I have to say because Joseph is is not a developer, um, 
He's, your your background, right, is in uh, molecular biology. Is that right? Yeah, molecular biochemistry. Yeah. Molecular biochemistry. Um, so I th I think uh, uh, you know it it speaks to um, the design of the language, the Rolang semantics that. Um, that people who aren't developers by trade can pick it up and start to make an interesting progress. I, I don't mean to put you on the spot, Joseph, but if you wanted to just give a quick overview of uh, the little uh, load balancer code that you've got so far, I'm sure some sure, people yeah. might be interested. <clears throat> yeah, just give me one second. <laughs> I posted the uh, link to the video for the uh, Seattle Hangout. It's already on the uh, YouTube. Fantastic. Um, I, I think you've covered it before. I, I, I'm a little bit confused in my uh, simpleton uh, understanding of this uh, now, uh, how the uh, storage layer is bound to the, to the VM uh, and how, you know, that, how, what language is that being implemented in? So the, the storage layer uh, is currently being implemented in Scala, right? Um, and that will be, how is that bound to the, to the row VM with the uh, rosette? Um, so uh, if you remember the, the yeah, that, it, it, yeah. So if, if you remember this, right? Um, yeah. And the, the final target here is that the VM is re-implemented in Scala, but even for um, even for uh, a um, uh, the C plus plus implementation, you can call out to, you can make instances and call out um, via J and I, so Scala through Java J and I to okay. make instances. So. Either one of, I mean, this is this this particular approach is is you know painful and very likely to be buggy and uh, all kinds of things. But but it's something that that is um, that that you know it, it can be done in about a weekend, um, so that you can instantiate from Scala an instance of the Rosette VM via J and I. Okay, thank you. Sure, no problem. All right, let me stop the screen here, hand it back to. <coughs> so, yeah, um, I'll just do a, a, just a, a quick walkthrough. But um, essentially what's going on uh, with the load balancer is that you, you get a request and um, in a concurrent implementation, uh, for every request you get, up to a certain limit, you want to be able to execute that in parallel with the other ones that you're getting. Um, so essentially we have, we have four uh, contracts here that compose to form the larger load balancer contract or, uh, or protocol. And the, uh, the load balancer would, would exist on, on one namespace or per namespace, right? Um, so just a, a, a very, and this is, this is also very, very naive. Um, it's, it's just a very, very simple implementation. And it also, uh, just for anybody who's coming, who's coming in now, it won't uh, compile currently, um, but soon to. <laughs> so uh, it essentially begins with a, with a work request um, from a requester. That's the do work uh, protocol that you see all the way to the left. Um, it'll send it to a collector which is responsible for vetting it for certain requirements, ensuring that it uh, has certain structural and behavioral properties of the requests that this node will accept. Um, it's also going to impose a limit, which as of now is, uh, is an integer, um, but ultimately uh, a limit, uh, in fact, to, to the amount of, of work that you can handle will be tied to memory uh, that'll be built into the language. Uh, we're then going to package up the work request and send it to a dispatcher. Um, and the reason for not including the limit in the, uh, in the dispatcher protocol is that we want the dispatcher to be as lean as possible. We, we want it to only focus on taking work requests and handing them to workers. Uh, with the collector, that's kind of our bottleneck here uh, so that the dispatcher can spin off as many workers as possible, as fast as possible, once the work requests have been vetted. So we kind of abstract 
um, a lot of the bookkeeping out to the collector. Um, and then, so, so once, once our dispatcher actually gets a work request, it's gonna spin off a worker per request that it gets. Um, so if we, if, if we get one work request, uh, the range of, of one to 50 of work requests will spin off 50 uh, workers, uh, if, if the limit so, so accommodates that. And then those workers will evaluate whatever process we've been sent to do uh, with our work request and they will communicate it directly back to the requester, uh, which means that the worker never has to communicate again with the dispatcher or the collector, um, except for kind of the collector to let it know when it's finished the, uh, the work request. But uh, yeah, so once we finish evaluation, uh, then we send a result back to the requester where then you'll see uh, we do some further processing. Um, and I, I don't have to walk through all the code unless you want me to, um, but um, this is essentially the, the code. I mean, this is a requester uh, where we define a, what a work request is, right? And then uh, what to do in the case that we actually get a work request, right? Or, uh, oh, sorry, sorry, no. This is where we create the work request here. Um, and then we'll send it off to the collector and wait for a response. This is a collector. Um, where we uh, match any sort of incoming message uh, to uh, a certain case. Uh, there, there are a couple cases, the two cases are that it is a work request that adheres to, to whatever uh, structural constraints we've, we've given uh, to our work request. And there's a case that the message coming in is actually a signal from uh, a worker that it's finished, right? And this is how we manage our limit. As you see, this is a kind of a naive accumulator here. Um, which is what I meant by uh, an integer limit, but um, but yeah, so um, then we have to define what a worker is. Um, a, a worker is, is essentially uh, is essentially an instance of an object that has fields for uh, an ID, for a channel where it takes work requests. Here, this is a channel that takes work requests called work. Um, a worker queue, right? And this is actually so, so it can't directly uh, really read off of the worker queue, but um, it can send to a worker queue. So what is a worker queue? The worker queue is actually where we're gonna store the channels of the workers, right? So what that allows us to do is to pull off a channel uh, for the worker that we want to give a work request. And that's actually the dispatcher's job. So you, essentially you have two kind of queues that are, that are always uh, in flux here. One is the work request queue uh, that the dispatcher is gonna read and then uh, pull off the top of whatever work request and hand them to a worker. And then you have the worker queue, uh, which is essentially just the list of the workers' different channels, right? And the channels that exist there are all the workers that you have at your disposal. Um, so again, that's the worker queue, right? So that is the channel that holds the channels uh, that hold work requests. Uh, and then you have a, a quit channel. And, and your quit channel is just gonna uh, take a Boolean value and do something in the case that, that is true or false, right? Um, so essentially here you'll see that uh, when we get a work request on the worker's work channel, right, defined here, then we're going to evaluate the process and send that the result that is, right? Send that result back to the address that we were given with the work request, right? And we can see actually back here that that was created as a return channel, right? And then with the requester, once we get that result, we'll do something else with it, right? Um, and then there is, there's another, uh, another case here wherein you get a, a message uh, from the quit channel, um, in which case you tell the collector that you quit so that it can decrement the accumulator, right? Uh, and again, this is naive. This is naive, but, but, but the point is that, and, and the powerful point here is that uh, all these workers can be uh, operating in parallel, which means that uh, regardless of whatever limit, right, um, we have said as long as it's not one worker at a time that the, the, design, is, the design of it is actually uh, is scalable. Um, so then you have the dispatcher, uh, and by the way, if anybody has any questions, I don't, I don't like to do monologues, so we can... Uh, we the, thing, the thing that I really like is this second for comprehension down there. 
um, because this, this is a pattern that, that's, that's quite general, right? The second four comprehension, you could think of it as a trading application, right? So the work request, you can think of it as Oh, a, yeah. Actually, like, like if you wanted to pair uh, like buys and sells on an exchange. That's right? exactly what that is, right? That's a, yeah. that's a, that's a pairing of a buy and sell. I, I want to <laughs> do some work. I want to, some work. There is, it's also a pairing um, for, you know, for, for lively gigs, you know, um, yeah. match, matching up work to uh, work requests. Yeah, I hadn't even considered that. That's a generalized, I didn't consider that. that, that was a yeah, that, that pattern is super, super general. Um, yeah, oh, that's cool. Right? And in mm -hmm. fact, if, if, if you had some kind of um, criteria, right, so if the work could only be accom accomplished if it, if it matched certain characteristics that you could query of the work request. Yeah. And, yeah. And, and the worker said, you know, I'm, I'm only looking for work that matches the matches these criteria. Right. So that, so would, be, that would be the con that you would put yeah. in that. Yeah. Or we could even include it as, as part of the worker structure. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's exactly right. That's exactly yeah. right. Uh, so we could include, uh, we can include things like, you know, what data types you'll take, uh, what behavior, what structure this is. I mean, this is obviously, this is a slim implementation. You just yeah. have four channels here, but potentially much more complex. Um, right. so, also, so, I mean, a general, a super, super general, um, right. <coughs> I mean, it, it, th this would be an extra layer, but so imagine if the work requests were decorated, um, with with a prologue term mm -hmm. that was that was essentially a goal right so so <coughs> so it would it would pr um think about it like this there's a it it it, it promises to supply some <coughs> uh certain things it promises to guarantee certain conditions yeah that it represents as some um uh, uh, uh um prologue terms yeah and, and then there's a particular um, uh, guarantee or, or reliance. It, it it needs it needs to be guaranteed certain things that it will only also, execute under certain conditions. Under, under those conditions, and then likewise, now imagine that the worker, the worker also has terms that that fall into those two categories, and that the worker that that the, the dispatcher provides a little prologue theorem prover. Right. So what it does is it it piles it piles together um, the the things that both work request and, and worker provide, and mm -hmm. then sees if oh, you can, see. yeah. sees if you can prove what both of them want uh, require as as the the, the guarantees, uh -huh. and, and if you can, then it goes forward. Yeah, and and could and, well, and it would have to spin off a worker then. So I wonder if you could like. Um, no, it doesn't. No, I mean you could actually you, you could you could utilize that. You know, in, in you don't have to spin off a worker for that theorem prover task. I mean, you can if you well, want. No, 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 not for that. Um, but but to like spin off a, a just in time worker kind of. Oh, you could also you could also do that. That's 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 also um, possible. You so, and and in fact, typically what you want to do is you you have a cache of workers. And then there's there's a there's a, a hard limit. This is the total oh, capacity, right? And then you 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 grow the cache and you shrink the cache, right? Yeah. To to meet certain memory memory uh, profile characteristics. Yeah. Uh, but 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 this general idea of doing a little bit of theorem proving to make sure that the that the the bid and the the the, the ask and the and the uh, sorry the sell and the buy um, uh, fit together. Is is in, is very general and very powerful because because we, we've already seen that this particular design pattern, you know, fits dozens and dozens of um, uh, of uh, domains, right? Whether it's yeah. trading or work or you know um, uh, you know uh, load balancing, right? All of all of those are um, all of those so, are well, applicable, but but you want the and, and each of these, are, I mean, they're effectively like a, a data stream, right? So they, I mean, they have the expressiveness of whatever a data stream would be. So if, if you were doing like a stock analysis application, then this could be uh, your ticker and this could be another 2,000 <laughs> other data streams that you were getting that were all dynamic um, that correct. you were waiting for. Yeah. That's correct. And <laughs> another one, another one, imagine that, I don't know, you wanted to do a social network. 
And, <laughs> and one of these was a supply of posts and the other was, um, which, which you're aggregating, right? So the, 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 the worker, is, oh, sorry, the work requests are the supply of posts and the worker is uh, who, should, uh, who should receive those posts, right? And then you have the cond. Uh, the, the cond is checking to see which of the, which of the participants that, that are listening would, uh, sh would pass the criteria uh, for those posts and then they, get, they receive the posts. So there's another example. Yeah, that's, I hadn't even, I hadn't even thought about that, to be honest. <laughs> and, um, what's kind of cool is also that, that your worker queue um, could, and, and this is like kind of going in the same vein of thought, but we could, uh, again, query the, the work channels and what workers were currently out um, as to the extent of their load um, or whatever type of load, and then manage the worker queue as if it were a heap. Um, and just in like, you know, pop swap, switch channels, merge channels, how, whatever you want to do um, so that it's even more dynamic um, at, at runtime. Yeah, very nice. Um, but, yeah, but, but, uh, but going forward, uh, anyway, this is the last bit. This is the meat and potatoes of the, uh, of the implementation or, or not implementation, but the model. <clears throat> um, and it essentially just says that when you get a work request on the work channel, right, that the dispatcher is listening to, and you have a worker, on the worker queue, then I want you to send that work request, right, to the worker's work channel. And as we saw in the last slide, once uh, the worker gets a work request on the work channel, then it evaluates and sends it back to the requester. And then what we're gonna do um, after that is recurse. Um, and this, this bit up here is essentially just us um, instantiating our workers. So, so one, one, th one piece of feedback that uh, I, I, I haven't given you before um, that I, I should give you now, since you, you've got worker queue parametric at the contract level, you don't have to do the new there right, at the top. What you want to do is when you stitch all these contracts together, so if you go all the way back to the top, right? Oh, like uh, here go all the way back to Go all the way back to the diagram. Oh, okay. Right. So, so running those nodes is going to be um, invoke. You, so, so the, the way to interpret this diagram in code mm -hmm. is the, all these top level um, uh, uh, boxes, do work, collector, dispatcher, mm -hmm. right? Those would all be put inside a, you know, um, a, a parallel composition. Mm -hmm. And on the outside of that parallel, and that's why they're, they all have their own independent vertical lines. And yep. then outside of that parallel composition, you have a new, which is going to create all of the channels that they need in order to communicate with each other. Right. So gotcha. those are, and so that's what that, the news that you've got sprinkled in through there will actually be factored all the way up to, uh, you know, outward in scope, but only as far as they're needed and not any further. So that would actually be, uh, that would be parametric on load balancer then? Uh, so, so you could put all of those inside load balancer rather than to do a new. Yeah, that's yeah. that's also correct. That, yeah. And then and then and then at some point you you in you uh, you actually invoke those contracts. Right now you just have the definition. Exactly. Yeah, I have it. At the, at the bottom, you actually have to invoke all those yeah. contracts with the with yeah. the, the the channels that you you yeah. either have passed in or you've done as a as a new. Yeah, I haven't I haven't called them. Um, yeah, and, yeah. yeah you're, you're here. You're just explaining each sub, but you haven't you haven't like assembled the load balancer with, and the the load the total load balancer is is each of the contracts running all together. And and I think what's 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 like kind of important uh, <coughs> and that when things really started to click for me uh, for people, and I don't know what our time is like here. So uh, we got about seven minutes left. Okay. Um, what really started to click for me is when um, like just in a practical implementation sense that. Um, we view a thing, something that's sending, a process that's sending, is a write to, and something that's listening, uh, your for, is a read from, right? And they're communicating over a similar location. And, and that's, that's really all it is. It's, it's like, it's really that simple. So we're just placing this. Eugene, is that you? No, I guess not. <laughs> No. Oh man, that was awesome! I wonder who that was. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Oh, well, um, since, 
Uh, sorry, Correct, sorry. That did not sound like ukulele, so it wasn't me. Okay, okay, okay. <laughs> um, uh, actually, uh, Joseph, I don't mean to cut yeah, you. Yeah, no. Um, uh, but um, since we do have Eugene here from uh, from Vulcanize, I wonder if Eugene would like to, to say hi, hi to the community and, and give an update from his perspective. Or, or if you just want to play ukulele for us, that's also Yeah, hi, yes. <laughs> you put myself on the screen here. Hi, how's it going, everybody? Hey. Uh, I don't really, I don't know if I can give you guys an update yet because we're, I'm just getting engaged with the process. Um, but, um, you know, our team is working right now on a component of the R chain where we have to deliver it within the next week or so. Um, and, uh, yeah, ukulele. Um, Give me a minute on that one. I'll be happy to join you. Maybe next time I'll give you a, give you a little bit of a, uh, you know, a comic relief, hopefully. <laughs> but uh, it's a pleasure meeting you all. The good, you guys can see me? Did I drop? Uh, no, you're here. You're here. Okay. Thank, you. Thank you so much. Uh, I appreciate it. I really enjoyed your playing yesterday. That was fun. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Um, okay, uh, let, let's see. I, I, if there's nothing else burning, um, uh, we can probably call, give it a wrap. Uh, and, you know, but uh, let me let me leave it open to see if there's anything. Oh, and uh, let me just say, Joseph, thank you so much. That was that was really great, and I totally appreciate your uh, going through the going through the process and and twice now giving a little walkthrough. Um, I think it's no, gonna... it, was, it was a lot of fun. I, I want to be able to get uh, the official uh, stamp of approval uh, to put it out there as content. So whenever we can uh, review the design itself and yeah. syntax, I would I'd really love to do that. T totally, totally. So there are a few things we need to clean up and then we'll, we'll definitely do that. Um, but cool. I think we're definitely getting there. And, and I think what, what's, you know, what's super important is that you, uh, you know, you've, you've begun to internalize the execution model and you realize for yourself <laughs> how dirt simple it is. <laughs> yeah, it will be. It's going to, well, I want to, I want to get a head start on building these things because <laughs> really quick once people, I think, adopt it. <laughs> yeah, so, yeah, 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 totally, totally. I absolutely mm -hmm. agree. Um, cool. So right. let's see. Uh, is it, was there any other uh, questions or comments? You know, uh, are people all just shell shocked by what's happened with all the executive orders? And, um, <laughs> <laughs> um, okay. No, it sounds it seems like uh, we're we're uh, we have silence from the from the community. <laughs> um, uh, oh, HJ, thank you. Yes, you reminded me. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. Thank you. Um, so, I, I, so HJ has offered to to be an early um, an early uh, bird in terms of the redemption process, uh, and I think that would be great. Um, so, what, what we're going to want is a few guinea pigs to run through the redemption process early. So, we've already got two. Um, who have who have come forward to, to run through the redemption process early, um, and um, and so we're going to want a handful of those, like five people, uh, so to provide us a kind of uh, a test, uh, you know, with 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 live data, um, uh, just to make sure that uh, that everything. Um, you know, goes through after all of the the sort of uh, simulated testing uh, that we're doing. Uh, so HJ, are you up, up up to be a guinea pig? Yes, sure. Would be a pleasure. And is the, is the whole process not clear? So I could f make another video about it. Oh, no, no, the, the process is clear, but there there is one small adjustment. I mentioned this last week, but I'm going to go ahead and mention it again in case people missed it. Um, uh, <coughs> uh, which is that um, there there are some... There, there's some risk with respect to KYC um, that, that we have identified, the legal team has identified. And so we're gonna go ahead and put a, um, a couple of fields. So supplying name and email address. Now we, we know that there's nothing that we can do that would prevent people from putting, you know, Michael E. Mouse at email.com and, you know, you know, one Disney drive. 
uh, in those fields. So there's, there's, there's nothing that we can do to ensure that people actually identify themselves. However, what we will do is to trade uh, that information for notifications and updates about the, uh, about the process. So, so you'll be notified and alerted when you have, um, when, when you, your amps are, are available in your wallet, so you don't have to keep checking your wallet every few seconds. Uh, and also, uh, we will utilize <coughs> that information um, to facilitate um, um, uh, sign, signing up, uh, uh, si signing up uh, for a co-op membership. Okay. Is, is, is this uh, page already ready? Is it made already? So the, the, the page the page is up and ready. Yeah, I, I showed it last week. Um, Maybe you could send me a link by email or so. Then. Yeah, I will do. I will do. Uh, as soon as yeah, I'll I'll, I'll I'll send you a link. And if also one more thing, uh, could I do uh, like a ten minute presentation the next week? Oh yeah. Organizing, uh, analyzing an organization for building smart contracts. Yes, I would love it. Brilliant. Yes. Sure. <laughs> yeah. I, I also, I also want to get some artists involved. You know, smart contracts for art. Like, like you know, we, we need people involved in this that are like Primavera, who made the plantoid stuff and the, the you know the smart contracts that were connected to live sculptures, right? This is the kind of thing we really need to open our brains to. Um, Shogo had um, Shogo had a great idea. He's not. I don't. I don't think he. Uh, <laughs> it well. Well, he would have. He would have wanted me to say it. <laughs> um, he had a great idea to uh, attach uh, artistry in different works. Um, like people do. They'll do graphic design for different coins that are kind of like uh, collector's edition coins, uh, and people are trading them for the artworks in particular. So if Archie never did like membership. Then it would be cool, I think, to um, attach graphic design and, and artistry uh, to those coins and memberships. Awesome. Well, that reminds me. Then, why, why don't we just make uh, next week, you know, you know, uh, our chain and art, and just talk about that and a few other things? Because I've got I've got two other uh, projects that I want I want to see built on top of our chain, and I'll, I'll talk about those as well. So until uh, until next week, um, and next week I will be uh, officially one year older. <laughs> My birthday is on Saturday, and so uh, you know um, if you if you want to uh, raise a glass <laughs> of coffee, a mug of coffee to me on Saturday. <laughs> Talk to you soon. <laughs> Ciao for now. What what time is next meeting next week? What day? So I can have it on calendar. Oh yeah, sure. It's always it's always uh, uh, Wednesdays at eleven. Okay, perfect. Thank uh, eleven uh, uh, Pacific, correct? Eleven Pacific time. That's right. Perfect. Yeah. Thank you so much. Sure. All right, guys. Sure